all so much for coming and being here. Um, my name is Emily Russell, and I do the marketing here at Clearview. Um, I've worked here for about two and a half years, and I'm originally from Walton County, so I love working here and being a part of the community and doing anything that we can to um, provide outreach opportunities. Um, so today our topic is going to be nutrition and wellness. Now how many of y'all set New Year's resolutions every year? That you're going to get healthy, you're going to eat better, you're going to exercise. All of us do, right? We all do. And how many people actually keep those resolutions? Probably very few. Maybe, or maybe you're like me and I keep it for like three weeks. And then I go, oh, okay, well, I lost a couple pounds. I'm going to go back to eating my cake and french fries. <laughs> um, so really, in order to make a habit or a resolution stick, it needs to become part of your daily life. And it can't be an inconvenience. It has to be something that makes sense for you, something that's easy for you to manage. Um, and there, there's knowledge that goes along with it, you know. For me, I feel like there are so many diets out there that are just fad diets. You know, don't eat any carbs and you'll lose 30 pounds. Well, okay, yeah, but are, is that healthy for you? Does that make sense for you? Um, I was reading an article last night about the no-carb diet that, that was saying it, it's terrible for you. It's just as bad as smoking is actually the article that I read last night. I don't know how true that is. I don't claim to be a nutrition expert. Um, but anyway, so there, there's so many different things out there that I want you guys to be educated consumers of food, educated consumers of nutrition and of exercise, and um, to be able to create a meal plan that works for you. Um, and I know some people struggle with different things, you know, whether it be diabetes or high blood pressure and things like that that need to be considered in a diet as well. Um, and so, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. So I'm just so glad that y'all are here and everybody is new and gonna be making these resolutions. That's awesome, it's fantastic. Um, thank you all for coming. And we are so pleased to have with us Ms. Julie Richardson. She's our registered dietitian here at Clearview. And she does a phenomenal job meeting with each of our patients that come in, coming up with meal plans and all sorts of good stuff. So I think that you guys will be um, just excited to hear what she has to say. And I hope that it'll be to where you can apply it in your life and that you can make it work. So um, so feel free to keep eating, sipping on your, your unsweet tea, whatever, make yourself at home. Um, we're real casual here, so if at any point you have any questions, just let us know. Please, that's my function best. So awesome, well I'm just gonna turn it over to Julie. And you can actually even just click that and it'll advance the next one. You Exactly. All right. Wonderful. So today we're just going to kind of go over an introduction, talk about healthy eating, physical activity, and maintaining a healthy weight. So when Emily asked me to do a presentation on healthy eating, I kind of didn't even know where to start. Healthy eating is just such a broad topic, and it's so different for everyone. Everyone has different health goals, different nutrition goals. And those goals change as you get older, as you get certain medical conditions, as you hit certain life events. So saying one thing works for one person and it'll work for everyone is very hard to do. So we're just going to kind of talk about some general nutrition things today that should work for everyone. But if you have a specific medical condition, the rules may change for you, your priorities may change a little. If you have any questions about that, feel free to ask. I have no problems answering those. I have plenty of other information in my office. I'll be more than happy to get you copies after the presentation. Um, but eating healthy and exercising are the keys to decreasing your risk for certain chronic diseases. It helps you maintain your weight, which can help decrease your risk for or help you control type 2 diabetes. It can help protect your heart and it can even help prevent some cancers. But remember your goals change. Not everybody's goals are the same. So the first thing is weight. And the way they kind of measure your weight and see how you're doing and what your risk for chronic diseases are is by doing your BMI and your waist circumference. Your BMI is a measure of your weight for your height and it tends to be a little inaccurate, like those bodybuilders who are all muscle, they're going to be really high on the BMI scale, but they're pretty healthy individuals. So there's a lot of kind of wiggle room in there, so you have to interpret it based on a few other things as well. But ideally, you'd like to be around 18.5 to 24.9, that is a normal BMI. 
If you're an older adult, 65 or older, you actually want to be a little higher. You like your BMI to be at least 20. And it's okay if it's overweight, which is this 25 to 29.9 range, as long as you don't have any of those comorbid conditions, the diabetes, the heart disease, hypertension, things like that. It just gives you a little more cushion. If you're gonna get the flu, you're, you know, you could fall and hurt yourself. It just gives you something to fall back on. And then waist measurement really is a big predictor of what they consider metabolic syndrome, which is diabetes, hypertension, high, um, triglycerides, high cholesterol, heart disease risk. And this is if you have a lot of abdominal obesity, which usually tends to be in men, they kind of tend to have the apple shape. That's when you're at increased risk. So women, you have about 35 inches. Anything over than that, waist circumference wise, you're at increased risk. <coughs> Gentlemen, you get a little more wiggle room at 40. So like I said, you want to kind of be in that middle range. You don't, you don't want your weight to be too much, because that's what you hear most of the focus on the media and now. Because um, you are at increased risk for the heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, etc. But you don't want it to be too low either. You want a little cushion to fall back on. And if you're underweight, it could mean you're not getting the proper vitamins, minerals, nutrition that you need to maintain a healthy lifestyle. So, healthy eating. You want to try to eat more fruits and vegetables. You want to eat a variety of colors. They say eat the rainbow. You want to shoot for at least five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. But really, the dietary guidelines for Americans goes all the way up to seven to ten servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Now, some of the serving sizes are a little different than you expect. Like a banana, for example, two servings. So you get, a, get to cheat a little there. Whole grains, you want your less processed grains. You want the brown bread, the brown rice, bless you, the whole wheat pasta. You want half of your grains to be whole grains. That's going to be about three servings a day. Low fat dairy, especially as you get older, you want the calcium and vitamin D to help you maintain strong bones. They recommend skim or 1% just to help with the calories and the extra fat. And if you're lactose intolerant, which I know a lot of people are as they get older, it could be the soy, it could be the almond milk, any of those you know, dairy substitutes work just fine. And then you really wanna shoot for lean protein. The turkey like you're eating now, chicken, fish, then you go and go for some other things like beans, nuts, and seeds. So kind of on the flip side of that, you really want to limit your intake of the processed foods. The more we've done to it, the more we've probably screwed it up. Processed foods tend to be higher in sugar. So they're like your sugar sweetened soft drinks, your desserts, your boxed cookies, foods that have a lot of saturated or trans fats. A saturated fat is a fat that is solid at room temperature. So if you can see that fat, that's a saturated fat. They tend to be found in animal products and the tropical oils like palm oil and coconut oil. But like if you've ever had leftover, I know tacos are really bad, or the nachos, whatever, and you go to open it, like reheat it the next day, that ring around the edge, that's the saturated fat. And you can kind of picture that in your arteries because that's the fat that's going to clog your arteries and cause a lot of problems. And trans fat is just a healthy fat we took into a lab and made an unhealthy fat. And those tend to be found more in like the shelf stable baked goods like the Entenmann donuts or any of those cookies, margarines, but they're trying to take those out of foods now. So you're seeing less and less of those. Processed foods also tend to be salty. Sugar and salt are preservatives. So if it's gonna be very shelf stable, chances are it's gonna be sweet or salty. Maybe both. So if you get canned fruit, canned vegetables, canned beans, put them in your colander, rinse them under water, it takes about half the salt away. Yeah. And avoid the refined grains. That's the white bread, the white rice, the white pasta. Pretty much we took it, we took away that outer shell where all the good nutrition is, the fiber, the vitamins and minerals. 
and just left you with the carbs. So some more general tips. Measure your food and read the food labels to see what they consider a serving size. It's always very surprising what the serving sizes are and they really tend to vary. Cereals, for example, can be anywhere from half of a cup as a serving to a cup and a half. So it's not like my husband who sit, literally sits there and pours the cereal and has to put his hand on the cereal as he pours his milk so it doesn't overflow. That is not a serving. <laughs> probably three or four and he wonders why he gains weight. So you definitely want to measure your food out. You can also do some hand measurements. If you don't want to carry around your little measuring cups with you everywhere you go, you can kind of estimate with hands and we'll go over that in just a minute. And you want to avoid eating in front of the TV. They found the best thing you can do for a general healthy diet, overall well-being for yourself, for your children, for your grandchildren, is to sit and eat at the table. The reasons for that is, you know, obviously the social aspect, the conversation, yep. but you also are able to listen to your body's cues. If you're watching TV, you're kind of absorbed in whatever that show is on TV. You're not going to listen to your body when it says, I'm full, stop eating. You're kind of just like that mindless eating where you down the whole bag of chips before you realize what you did, and then you feel very guilty. All right, so hand measurements. Two cups, two hands here is about an ounce. Your thumb is a tablespoon. The tip of your thumb is a teaspoon. Most fat servings you want right at that tablespoon. Your fist is a cup or a small piece of fruit. Obviously, women are going to have smaller fists. Men are going to have larger, so this is why this is just an estimate. Your palm is three to four ounces. That is really what they recommend for a serving size of meat. Most people need six to eight ounces of protein <coughs> and meat a day, about the 21 ounce steaks you get when you eat out these days. And about three ounces is the size of a deck of cards if you want another estimate. And one cupped hand is half of a cup, which tends to be your serving size for most fruits, vegetables, grains. When in doubt, assume it's half a cup. And then you also want to look at food labels. The first thing you want to look at when you look at food labels is up at the very top where it says serving size. Like I said, it's what the manufacturer considers a serving size, not what you consider a serving size. Um, I know when I teach diabetes class, a good example we always use are Pop-Tarts. If you look on the back of the label for Pop-Tarts, one Pop-Tart is a serving, but they come in a foil package of two. Who eats just one Pop-Tart? I'm going to have a Pop-Tart. I mean, you're a better person than me. <laughs> I will eat all, both Pop-Tarts. That's how they come. So I will then have to double everything on the nutrition label. Yeah. Then you can look at calories if that's what your goal is, if you're counting your calories. If you have diabetes, you're going to want to look at total carbohydrates. <laughs> Every 15 grams is a serving. If you have congestive heart failure, hypertension, some renal issues, and you're paying attention to your sodium, you're gonna wanna look over here at sodium, cholesterol, fat if you're trying to protect your heart, saturated fats, trans fats, cholesterol are all near the top. Now you're gonna wanna pay attention over here to the grams. Don't worry about this highlighted section with the percentages. What that is, is the percent to meet the needs for a young active woman who consumes 2,000 calories a day. Pretty sure that's not most of us in here. So ignore those, they just get confusing. And focus on the actual grams and measurements. Any questions about reading a food label? Anything anyone looks at in particular that I didn't mention? I have a question. Uh -huh. What is the difference between dietary fat, I mean the fiber, and soluble or insoluble fat? Um, dietary fiber could be either soluble or insoluble, and it really just is a chemistry term, whether or not they dissolve in water. 
the soluble fiber does dissolve in water. So which one would be the best? They do different things. The ones that don't dissolve, that your body can't digest the insoluble fiber, is going to help kind of with your bowels, keep you regular. Um, you're going to absorb some of the extra cholesterol. The insoluble fiber is going to be what kind of helps fill you up. It's going to help with blood sugar control, lipid control as well. So you need both, but it depends what your goal is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So some quick tips for planning and preparing meals. The best thing you can do is just plan before you shop. Think about your week, think about the meals that you're going to eat at home, plan out your shopping list, what coupons do you have, what's on sale if you're trying to shop on a budget, what fruits and vegetables are in season if you're trying to go for fresh fruits and vegetables and but again, on a budget. You know, if, have you ever been to the grocery store and you walk in and you're so hungry and then you just buy whatever looks good? Yeah, totally cannot walk into the store hungry. Unless I have my list and then I can stick to my list and I can get in and get out. So that's the way to keep yourself from temptation. It's also a good idea to cook ahead. Like if you have an easy Sunday afternoon, make a couple of larger meals for the rest of the week put them in Tupperware containers, either freeze them or put them in your fridge. That way as you get busy during the rest of the week, you can just kind of defrost it, put it in the microwave and you're good to go. Or if you're tired, if cooking is a hard thing for you, you know, just prepare one day and then you have your easy to go quick meals the rest of the time. And then keep frozen canned fruits, vegetables, beans, those healthy foods keep them available. Frozen or canned are fine. Ideally, fresh, but if you're in a household of one or two people, those foods are likely to get bad quickly. So canned, frozen are good options. You want to try to get things that don't have gravies or sauces, that aren't pre-seasoned, because those are going to be a lot higher in the fats and the salts, more processed. If you get, like I said, the canned vegetables, mm -hmm. Excuse me. Oh, yeah. I didn't realize you were going to answer me that quick. Ten years ago, mm -hmm. when I was diagnosed with congestive heart failure, I was told, do not eat canned veggies. No way, no shape, no how. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I had a 10 to 15 percent ejection fraction. Mm -hmm. Now it's up to 50. Congratulations. That's what God does. Yep. He feels like if we rinse the cans, rinse the food, pour the mm -hmm. all the water out and rinse it two or three times, that it might be okay um, I'd like to hear your opinion of that. Studies have shown that if you do that, you get about 50% of the salt off. Mm -hmm. So it does cut it back. Um, they still use a lot of salt to preserve things, so it's still going to be fairly high. But if your options are eat the canned vegetables that you've rinsed, or don't eat any vegetables at all, I'd rather you have the vegetables that you rinsed. Okay. Um, the other things you can do is they have some that are no added salt or low sodium. They're really hard to find. If you have ever been into the vegetable section and you've tried to find them, I literally sit there and stare at them for about 10 minutes so I can find one or two cans of like corn or green beans that are low in salt, but they are available. Yep. And frozen would be the better option to the I, I try to go that route. I try to go with the frozen mm -hmm. or fresh because I try to steer away from the canned mm -hmm. foods because of what I was told, <coughs> you know. Like yeah. I said, it was 10 years ago. And, and it, like I said, it's your goals and your health things change. Like if you have congestive heart failure and you're watching your sodium, I definitely would push more of the frozen than the canned. But if you tend to be like my mother-in-law who has low blood pressure and <laughs> puts salt on everything, canned's great for her. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not me. <laughs> we had to have a discussion. <laughs> Thank you for you. frozen have a lot of sodium in it also? It shouldn't unless it has a sauce. If it has like a butter sauce, um, some are pre-seasoned, right. those are going to have a lot of sodium in it. Otherwise, it shouldn't really have but any at all. I mean, you frozen vegetables, mm -hmm. not meats, but yeah. vegetables should not. Right. Okay. 
Yeah, as long as you avoid the ones with the sauces. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> I could just as well take you through that. That's one of my health problem issues. And I do rinse the vegetables, but then I add chicken broth and fish cook it. Now, is that... Chicken broth, broth is yeah. going to have a fair amount of sodium, and it, even the low sodium chicken broth is still so going to have a lot. Sodium. So you're taking some salt away to add some more salt back. Oh, because I don't do salt. Oh, I mean, you may not be adding extra salt, but the broth is going to just naturally have salt in it. They've added it to make the broth more flavorful. don't have a lot of it. I mean, they have low fat, low sodium oh. broth, but it's still going to have some salt in it. Cook a fresh chicken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just use the Mrs. Dash's seasonings or some other herbs, spices, instead of the um, chicken broth. Herbs and seasonings instead of the chicken broth. Well, I was doing that for the taste of the taste of the Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But try, yeah, then this is Dash or some just different herbs and spices. <coughs> Any other questions? Is there what is the lowest sodium? If you want to make a good chicken broth at home, I can't use bouillon because it's enormous oh, yeah. in sodium. Mm -hmm. Nothing but salt. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Is there anything on the market that you can make a good chicken broth out of? There isn't a low sodium bouillon to my knowledge. I get one of the ones that's already made, low fat, low sodium. This one since has a brand, but mm -hmm. there are several different varieties and they all end up being pretty comparable. Still, you know, salt in them, but less salt than the regular variety. Same with soups. Even the low-sodium soups are still going to have five, six hundred milligrams. Oh, yeah. When if you have congestive heart failure, you're shooting for 1,500 total all day. Right. So you just add a third of your salt recommendation for the day. What a, what sodium intake should you have? For Americans, it's 2,300 milligrams is the recommendation. Most Americans consume upwards, of like twice that, four, five, six, um, hundred milligrams. Here in the hospital, if we're going to put you on a low sodium diet, we're going to do a two gram sodium diet. It's not as low as the recommended 1,500 for congestive heart failure. But most people are so used to the salty foods, they even complain about the two gram sodium and are begging me for bacon. So it's true. Makes it hard. Any other questions? Those are all very good. No. All right. You mentioned for Americans, you've said that several times. What do we get from the diet of the rest of the world? Americans. We tend to be a little behind the curve in a few things. Uh, so, um, so that's what you're saying. Mm. Yeah, like that we were behind with the trans fats and things like that. But I'm using the USDA dietary guidelines yeah, for Americans. That's what it's called. So. And then the fruits, be careful on what they're packed in as well, especially if you have problems with blood sugar control, diabetes. Mm -hmm. You want things that are packed in natural juices. The more syrupy, the more added sugars. So you're taking away a lot of the nutrition. A few other tips, and this is probably, these are probably two of the biggest ones. Eat breakfast and don't skip meals. Yeah. The majority of the patients that come talk to me who have really bad blood sugar control problems, who can't control their weight, it's pretty typical that they're eating one <coughs> You want to eat multiple times a day. They recommend at least three meals a day. A few snacks aren't bad either. For a few reasons. You want to keep your metabolism going. We were designed for times of feast or famine, but now most of us aren't in a famine state. There's plenty of food around. So you just need to remind your body of that or it's going to hold on to everything it has for all it's worth and you're not going to lose anything. You'll slow down your metabolism. The other reason is you may be on medications that could lower blood sugars or affect your appetite or need to be taken with food. So you want to make sure your sugars don't get too low if you have diabetes. And then if you're hungry, you're not thinking with your head, you're thinking with your stomach. 
I know if I skip meals, by the time I get home, I open my fridge, all I want to do is eat junk food. Mm -hmm. Because my body wants the quick sugar fix. <coughs> and then drink plenty of water. Water helps fill you up. 70% you know, of your body is water. It's used in a whole bunch of metabolic processes. So you want to make sure you're getting about eight glasses of water a day. 70% of my body is water. Nah. <laughs> I have a question uh -huh. on the water. Like, if you do those crystallite, mm -hmm. is that considered? Yes. Like you want to water? avoid things that have caffeine in them. Go ahead. Teas, coffees, caffeinated sodas. Because caffeine's a diuretic, which means it'll just make you pee it all out. <laughs> so, you may be drinking a lot of those, but they'll actually dehydrate you in the end. So, as long as you're avoiding the caffeine, it could be juice though that will raise your blood sugars and provide a lot of calories. So I'd say limit your juice servings to one glass a day. Um, milk is fine. Also provide calories, good source of calcium and vitamin D. You wanna shoot for about three servings of dairy products a day. So that'll count towards your eight glasses. The crystal light's great. Uh, the sugar substitutes are totally a personal preference. They're, you know, man-made. Some people have different feelings on them. They don't raise blood sugar, so they're a great idea if you really have a sweet tooth, you like your soda, and you have diabetes. They have come out with some research now saying that it may contribute to weight gain, but most of the research seems to be saying that it's sweet, so if you drink a lot of those like diet sweetened sodas, your body is still going to crave the sweet, so you're going to cheat somewhere else because that's just what your body's craving and kind of what it's used to. So if you're being very proactive on counting your carbohydrates if you're diabetic or watching what you eat if you're paying attention to calories, diet drinks are a good addition. It'd be a safe addition. Mm -hmm. I have a catch two situation going mm -hmm. on in here. <clears throat> I know that the juices are good for me, mm -hmm. but orange juice, mm -hmm. And my body don't mix apple juice, the acid. When I drink the juice, the acid creates infection. Mm -hmm. So what do you do in a case like that? How can you get your juice nutrients? Actually, the whole fruit is better than the juice, period. Okay. So if you can go for the whole fruit and avoid the juice, even better. Okay. If you're a juice person and want your juice, I'd recommend just one serving a day. If you don't need the juice, don't drink the juice. Okay. So yeah, and if you have problems with some of the more acidic fruits, I'd go with the less acidic fruits. Enjoy the melons, bananas, things like that. All right. And they've shown that you can diet, but you won't lose weight. Or you can do physical activity, but you won't lose weight. Because if you're just dieting, you're going to be tired and you're not going to be as physically active. If you're just exercising, instead of watching what you're eating, you're going to be more hungry, so you're going to eat even more. So you actually have to do both diet and exercise in combination to help maintain a healthy weight. Both individually will help promote a healthy lifestyle, but in combination really go even further. So you want to shoot for at least 30 minutes of moderate physical activity most days of the week, but it really tends to vary. Those USDA dietary guidelines for Americans actually go all the way up to 90 minutes for weight loss. Now most Americans aren't even doing the 30 minutes of physical activity. So going from zero minutes to 90 minutes, rude awakening, and probably not very safe. So you can start just doing 10 minute increments, three 10 minute increments a day. It's just a good way to start. And you wanna do a variety of different physical activities. I have this handout right here. that talks about the different types of physical activities where you have endurance, that's like your cardio to help strengthen your heart. You have strength training to build your muscles up which is really important as you get older, your muscles start to deteriorate, so your weight may stay the same, but you're actually getting more fat, less muscle. So it's very important to do strength training as you get older. 
Balance, also really important as you get older. I'm gonna decrease those falls and help with flexibility as well. Things like Tai Chi and yoga. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that physical activity and balance are somehow associated? Mm -hmm. And you wanna do exercises that are gonna help you with your balance. Mm -hmm. So this handout talks about those four different types of physical activities, give you ideas on what you can do, how often and how long they recommend you doing those things. So for balance, they recommend, you know, walking heel to toe in a straight line, standing on one foot, stand up from a chair, sit down without using your hands. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I cannot do uh, activities and stuff like that as far as physical, mm -hmm. but, uh, Okay, I'm very active all day long. Mm -hmm. Now, is that considered good or? Yeah. Good? Every little bit of activity you do is going to help. Yeah. When I'm in the hospital and I'm calculating your energy needs, I, we do an activity level. <coughs> and if you sit, your activity level is like 1.4. If you're up and active and standing all day, it's 1.9. So. There is a big difference with between a sedentary lifestyle and just a general active lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You said start with 10 minute increments. At what point do you work yeah. up? As much as you're able. Listen to your body. And that's, I have some more things. Um, but you know, as much as your doctor will allow, don't start any physical activity regime. It's very seriously without talking to your doctor to see what limitations you might have, what recommendations they may have. If you're a diabetic, your sugars will decrease when you do physical activity, which is good. It helps with blood sugar control, but at the same time, you need to make sure you have some sugars available so your sugars don't bottom out. So I'd want to talk to my doctor about that. Um, if that's your situation, so they can help give you some tips and tricks and advice and be aware of your medication or maybe tell you what time of day would be the best for you to exercise. Yeah. Recommend having a sugar source before you exercise, have something available as needed. If you have back problems, joint problems, you know, certain exercises might not be good for you. So you definitely want to talk to your doctor before you start any exercise routine. And the most important thing is just to find something you enjoy. There's not one physical activity that's going to work well for everybody. The best one is the one that you actually do. So for me, I'm not much of a gym girl. I really wish I was. I really admire those people who get out and run. I'm just not the, that person. I really like to read. So I sit on my treadmill, lift up the incline, put a book there, and I'm rewarding myself as I walk. <laughs> so you find those little things that work for you. <laughs> Getting other friends involved. I'm much more likely to go to the gym if my husband goes to the gym with me. I will not go by myself. I'm uncomfortable there. Safety in numbers. Uh, walking could be a social group activity. Get a group of your friends together and just walk around the neighborhood, walk around the mall, find a place that you're comfortable, a park, things like that. And start with small specific goals. Going from the zero minutes to the 90 minutes, that is not small. <laughs> But if you can say, you know what, I'm going to shoot for three 10 minute increments, that's most days of the week, that is small, measurable. Once you've hit that and you're comfortable there and you feel energized, bump it up to two 15 minute increments or three 15 minute increments. Whatever your body is telling you you're able to do. Like I said, talk to your doctor before starting any physical activity regime. You want to just take your time, warm up, cool down, don't just jump in to the running. You know, definitely stretch out because you don't want to have any injuries. Start slowly. I think we've talked about that a lot. Wear good shoes. That's one of the things I like about going to the gym is that means I get a new wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> get loose fitting comfortable clothing, get shoes that are going to support you, especially if you have any problems with your feet, you have diabetes, you have any arthritis, you definitely want good shoes if that's the case. If you're able to afford it, I'd go to a like, running store or a really 
good shoe store and they'll be able to tell you what shoes are going to help with your condition. Yeah. Listen to your body. If you're feeling dizzy, short of breath, really tired, really sore, even if you haven't done your 10 minutes or your 30 minutes or whatever your goal is, stop. Your blood sugars may be low, your you know, heart may be doing something irregular, you're just pushing it too much, you may not have had enough to drink. Just step back, listen to your body, take it slow, and make sure you're drinking plenty of water because you're gonna sweat if you're being physically active, especially if you're doing the cardio. So just make sure you stay hydrated. Any questions about diet, exercise, conditions? I have a question <laughs> about drinking as you're eating a meal. Is it good to drink a lot as you're eating? Should you limit your fluid intake as you're eating? It depends on what your goals are. If you are trying to eat less, and lose weight, I'd recommend drinking while you're eating because it's gonna fill up your stomach. If you have a problem where you eat a few bites and you fill up really fast, stop drinking 30 minutes before you eat, wait 30 minutes after you eat. If you ever had gastric bypass, that's the rule too. Um, so really it just depends on what your goals are. What can, uh, I'm having a lot of I walked all my life, and I'm having trouble walking now. And I'm just, but I do exercises standing at the counter mm -hmm. in the kitchen, push up. I mean, uh, I like to push up on my toes and heels, and then kick my legs out to mm -hmm. the side, to the back, and stand on one leg for know, three up to about the count of ninety. And then I sit down and do exercises with my hands and arms. Perfect. Uh, is, is, that, is that sufficing? That's great. I mean, we definitely don't want you to exercise and put your health and your life at risk. So if you find getting around is becoming a problem, you're tending to fall a lot, don't start walking. Yeah, do things at the counter where you can support yourself. Chair exercises are great. When I was in graduate school, I went around to the senior centers and we do physical activity with them and they were always chair exercises. And we would get like a ball from the dollar store, one of those almost like kickball size balls. And we would use that and like put it under your arm, works for some strength training, just makes it kind of more fun. You can take cans, if you have big canned goods at home, you can use those as weights. So you don't have to go buy expensive weights or anything like that. You can just sit there and lift while you watch TV. We had um, the exercise band we use for our legs. So there's a lot you can use. I'm doing all of those. Yeah, sitting. Perfect. And then if you fall a lot, a pool might be a good option if you have access to that. Water aerobics, things like that. You get the resistance for the strength training. You're not going to fall and hurt yourself because you're in the water. And then I saw a question over here. Oh, okay. If my blood sugar is say 50, okay. I need to get it to at least 80. Mm -hmm. How much carbohydrate do I need to get it to? If my sugars were low, I would have one serving of carbohydrate, but I would make it a very simple sugar that your body's going to absorb really fast and shoot your sugars up. Orange juice, soda, a candy bar without nuts in it, and I would if it was hard candy, I'd chew it up and swallow it really fast. Because you're going to want your sugars at that point to come up. Because low blood sugars in the moment are actually more dangerous for you than a high blood sugar. Because in essence, you're starving your brain of energy. Mm -hmm. Okay, what would you say about starving my brain? Your <laughs> brain, the fuel source it likes to use is glucose, the blood sugar. Oh, so I if your blood sugars are low, you're kind of starving your brain of energy. I don't have to worry about that. And then, so yeah, you get altered mental status, procedures, pass out. It's not good if it progresses. Mm -hmm. Going back on the nutrition facts, is there a set, like, I mean, I know it's not a set number, but like if you looked at something that you know, like, the fat intake, try not to get anything over such and such, or the carbohydrates, you know, something like this is way over what you should have. Is there like a set number that you should watch for? Um, <coughs> carbohydrates, you want about half of your calories to come from carbohydrates. 
it's 50 to 60 if you don't have percent if you don't have diabetes. Um, and then fat, you want less than 10 grams of the saturated fat, the bad fats, but you're going to want about 15 to 20 percent of your calories to come from fat, no more than that. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're going to want about 30 percent protein, 20 percent fat or so, and about 50 percent carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. And sugar, like I do a the curves workout, mm -hmm. and it seems like they really pay attention to sugar, like lots of low sugar, I guess because sugar turns into fat. So is there a percentage of sugar that's... Not all carbohydrates are created equal. You have simple and complex carbohydrates, and it goes back to the good old days of general chemistry and structure. But the simple carbohydrates are things like table sugars, that are more processed, they're smaller structures, so your body's going to break them down really fast, it'll shoot your blood sugars up higher, and those are the ones that tend to be stored more so than the more complex carbohydrates like the whole grains, the whole um, fruits, the beans, those are carbohydrates as well, but they're going to take longer for your body to break them down, your sugars aren't going, aren't going to go as high as fast you'll be able to digest them more and you're less likely to store them as fat. So I wouldn't worry so much about limiting the total sugars, but I would limit my simple sugars. And then one other question, the splendor and all that, I mean, are you better off, like I asked my curves coach and she said, Liz, I just eat regular sugar, I don't worry about all the substitutes, and I just try to limit as much as I can. It depends on your health goals and your personal preferences. If you have a sweet tooth and you're going to eat something sweet regardless, especially if you have diabetes, I'd go for a product with the non-caloric sweeteners like the Splenda. If you have good self-control and you don't have much of a sweet tooth and you know a cookie is an occasional treat for you, I'd probably go with the regular sugar variety myself. But Splendor and all that is healthy. I mean, yeah, it, anything that's sold as a food in this country has to be proven safe before it can go on the market. So I wouldn't trust any of those non caloric sweeteners you found in like the vitamin mineral section because they can sell those and then the FDA has to prove that they're not safe. So I would trust more of the ones that have been around for a while. Um, personally, it's a taste preference. I prefer the taste of Splenda, but Splenda is the only one actually made from sugar. It's chlorinated sugar. Um, the only studies that I know that have found any problems was aspartame and rats, and it was above like anything anyone would ever consume amounts of aspartame, and it affected their bladders, but rat bladders are different than human bladders, apparently, so <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> But you know, it's a, like I said, personal preference. Some people just want to go natural. Some people, you know, that clean eating. Some people are okay, you know, with the non-caloric sweeteners. But as a nutritionist, you would say they're fine. Mm -hmm. I eat them on occasion, yes. I don't have Splenda every day. I'm pregnant right now, so I'm trying to eat less of it. You know, because being pregnant, stevia is more natural. So that's, you know, a good choice as well. Okay, my brother and I have an ongoing thing. He uses stevia. Mm -hmm. I use Splenda. To me, the stevia leaves an aftertaste, whereas the Splenda does not. Yeah. Which one is healthier for me? They're about the same. It's a taste preference at that point. That's why I like the Splenda. It's the only one I like the taste of. The rest of them are gross. I won't touch them. So, personally, <coughs> but I like the Splenda. I have Sweet and Low in my house because my parents were in town for Christmas. <laughs> and my mother likes the pink packet, so it varies. <laughs> I won't get touched until she's back in town. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. They're all really good questions. Now, what about the, the low carb, high protein trends? What is that Not doing in reality? <laughs> in reality, it's killing your kidneys. Um, if you're not consuming a lot of carbohydrates, then your body is going to break down the fat and the protein in your muscles 
to make the sugar so your brain has the energy. So the concept behind the high protein, low carb thing is, well, I'll make sure you have enough amino acids and protein so you're not losing muscle mass but I'm gonna put you in, your body into that starvation state so you switch metabolism processes and you start burning the fat for energy, yeah. which short term is great. You do see good results with things like the Atkins diet, but if you're consuming that amount of high protein, especially if you're not drinking a lot of water, most people end up damaging their kidneys mm -hmm. if they do it long term. They get mean because their sugars aren't going to be as high as they should be. Um, and it's not sustainable. Once you stop eating that way, you're just going to gain all the weight back. And you're usually consuming a lot more saturated fats, cholesterol with those diets. Yes, if you look at the lab results of those patients, they may have lower cholesterol readings because you're losing weight. And that will lower those readings. But the risk it does to your kidneys, there's no scientific evidence that it's beneficial. Eat all your food groups. Don't ever follow a diet that says cut something out entirely. Where do you get these amino acids? Where? Proteins. They're the building blocks of proteins. Okay. Yeah. And meat has all of them. So if you're yeah. eating meat, you're fine. If you're a vegetarian, you need to kind of balance them out to make sure you get all of them. but. I love my meat. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the um, nutrition diet for diabetes? My mother was just diagnosed with diabetes, went on the nutrition system diet, because she was controlling her diabetes, which is diet and exercise. And she controlled her sugars really, really well while she was on it, because they portion out your meals, they can control your carbohydrates. So while you're on it, it's a good choice. However, it doesn't really teach you how to eat, doesn't teach you how to portion, doesn't teach you what to eat, it doesn't teach you how to count carbs. So the second my mom got tired of eating the same thing all the time, or went on vacation, stopped following the meal plan, she's back to her old eating habits, gains back all the weight she'll lose, she'll lose 40 pounds, she's probably been on the diet three or four times at this point. And we'll lose like 30 to 50 pounds each time, but gains it all back plus some. Because she's not learning yeah. how to eat healthy. She's just eating packaged food for a while that portions it for her. But it's good like for a jump start. Mm -hmm. It's a good jump start. Um, if you do the work and you know learn how to portion and get off of it with a plan and support yeah. in place, mm -hmm, I think it could work. But it just doesn't necessarily teach you. Weight Watchers is about the only one that I know that teaches you how to eat and how to count and what to pay attention to. But even then, just general lifestyle, diet, exercise changes. There's no real specific diet that works other than general healthy eating. Somebody on a low sodium diet. Okay. Is cornbread allowed I mean it really depends on your cornbread is it the sweet cornbread or the salty cornbread it's just it's probably salty cornbread because mm -hmm. it's self rising yeah most of the baked goods like that are going to have salt in them so I'd limit my intake yeah. of those and if you really are a cornbread person and you want that one piece on occasion be careful what you have it with Beans. <laughs> yeah, I'd have it with, if you were going to make some pinto beans and not add a lot of salt to them, that would be great. If you were going to have it with super salty chili, probably not a good combination. I don't, I, I don't do salty chili. I do homemade chili. There's just, mm -hmm. <laughs> my ingredients are in it. I don't buy mm -hmm. the... Yeah, if you're the, making it with fresh ingredients and you've, you know, soaked the beans and you've cut out all the sodium yeah, you yeah, can, yeah, that's, and that's where you want to spend your sodium allowance. That's I cooked my own pinto beans the night before mm -hmm. to go in the chili yeah. so that I don't have to use the can. can. That's yeah. exactly, that's perfect. And it's the same way with sugars. If you're a diabetic and you have that sweet treat that you want, plan for it. Don't have it with a meal with a lot of carbohydrate. But if you, it's your birthday and you want that piece of cake, have a salad and then a small piece of cake. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Give me a portion size on, on the cornbread. It's like a two-inch square. About the size of one muffin? 
Yeah, I think it's a two inch square is small, the portion size they recommend. 